Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Russell Spence. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> I'm a member of the Carl Gables group, and I haven't found enough to have a drink since January 25th, 1981, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful to be here. It's a privilege whenever anybody asks you to share it in any meeting. It's a privilege to be able to, uh, uh, you know, when, when Dick Williams, who was a wonderful man, uh, you know, uh, when Wayne told me he asked me to do this, it was uh, just a privilege to be able to say yes, and so... I'm glad I'm here. I'm suffering. And I'm, I'm suffering from. I'm suffering from a, a cold. If I don't hug you, kiss you, shake your hand, it's not because I don't like you. It's just because I'm. Uh, this is the deal. I'm just. I don't want you to get it. Um, I. Uh, I'm in a weakened state. Uh, you know this. Uh, you know it's Miami, right? During the summer. Man, I don't know. I don't know. It just sort of like it, it seems like the heat sort of just saps all the energy out of you. You know, even when I don't have a cold, and now I have a cold, so I feel like I'm just really, it's like all the energy's been sapped out of me. You know, interestingly enough, uh, it, it is, um, you know, whenever I talk, you know, I never prepare anything, but what I really pray for is that, you know, the Lord gives me the ability to somehow, in some way, transmit or communicate to people exactly what's going on with me and what I've been through. Uh, sometimes it's sort of like a daunting task because, I mean, to tell you the truth, sometimes I don't even know what I've been through. Sometimes I don't even understand what's going on with me or how things are. I, I see certain things happening. I see things happening in my life. I see, you know, like they say in the big book, ideas, emotions, and attitudes, which were the driving force of these men's lives, are shifted to one side and become dominated by a different, uh, a different set of ideas, emotions, attitudes. I see the results. I see things happening. But I'm not really quite clear exactly what or how it's happening. Sometimes, as a matter of fact, most of the time, when I, when I see changes in my life and things that are happening and it becomes clear to me, it's maybe months or years after it's actually happened, I just sort of notice them. And, uh, and, 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 and sometimes you just have to have a lot of time. You have to go through a lot of time so you can look back, you know, and sort of see sort of like what the difference is, you know, between the first 10 years, the first 20 years, and the next 30 years, and that kind of thing. And so, uh, and, and then to try to piece it together and have it make some sort of sense and how the steps have anything to do with it and what's the overall picture, it's, uh, it's a hard deal, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and so I'm going to try to sort of, you know, in my way, sort of piece together some of the aspects of this thing, what's happened to me. And, uh, and you know, I talk a lot about God, and there's a reason for that, and I'm probably going to talk a lot about it now, and hopefully I can make that clear, you know, as far as what that's, what's that all about. Um, you know, it, it, it's, um, there's, there's, there's something about being weak, like the way I am right now. Uh, because of the cold, because of the weather, because I'm tired, because I only got about three or four hours sleep last night because of this cold. There's something about being weak that, um, I don't know, it's sort of like I feel closer to God. You know, I, uh, I you know, in, in, uh, first Corinthians, in, in the, in the book of Corinthians, I'm not sure whether it's first or second, one of my favorite lines is the Apostle Paul, who I'm convinced might have had a little bit of us in him, you know what I mean? If you know anything about the Apostle Paul, you know? And uh, he has this great line, and it's one of the great, it's, it's fantastic. He says, he doesn't explain it. You know, this is the guy who says, I want to do the will of God, but I'm always screwing up. This is the, this is the Apostle who says, I want to do the will, this guy wrote 13 books of the New Testament. He says, I want to do the will of God, but I'm always screwing up. What a worthless, what a wretched man I am. Who's going to save me? This is the guy. I mean, if alcoholics and addicts want to identify with anybody, this is the guy. And in, in Corinthians, he's always talking about his faults and how he's screwing up. And he's the one who's really considered like one of the main guys. And this is a line he says, and it's just amazing. 
he says, he says, he says, I've had some great, incredible things happen to me, but I've given a thorn in my flesh, a thorn of Satan, a satanic thorn. He never mentions what it is. He never mentions what it is. You know, well, you know, a lot of people like to say, think it's something like nearsightedness. You know what I mean? But uh, I don't know what a nearsightedness is a thorn from Satan, you know? Uh, if you're an alcoholic or addict or something like that, like me, you tend to think that when somebody like Paul says, I've been given some sort of thorn in my flesh that's killing me, you know, and I've asked God to remove it, you tend to think it's something really bad. And it's probably the reason why he was embarrassed or whatever that he didn't mention it. Maybe it's good that he didn't mention it. It could have been, could have been alcoholism. It could have been drug addiction. It could have been, it could have been lust. It could have been anything. But it was bothering the hell out of Paul. And he says, I asked three times for the Lord to remove it from me. And this is what he says God said. He said, God said, I will not take this from you. He says, to keep you from becoming conceited. I'm an alcoholic. I know all about feeling like, I know all about being a hot shot full of shit, thinking you're a conceited guy. I know all about vanity and, you know, ego and all that sort of stuff. I know about that deal. He says, to keep me from, and you know, the Apostle Paul, he was like, the, he was like a PhD. He was like the Attorney General of Israel. He was like the he was like a big shot. He says to keep me to, to from becoming conceited, he gave me this thorn of this thorn. He says he says I will not take it from you because when you're weak, I'm strong. When you're weak, I'm strong. That's what he says. He says he says, but my power, my grace, will will keep you steadfast will save you. And I like to add the words one day at a time. Because he did always say it was like, well, put on the full arm of God one day at a time. So, I mean, this program is pretty old. It's been around for a long time. <laughs> and, and so you'll understand when I tell you that as I look back on my life, I, I honestly believe that the closest I've ever been, in a sense, to God was before I even came today when I was lying on that hospital gurney. And I was, and I had nothing, and I was nothing, and I thought my life was over. And I looked up and I said, and I said, God help me. Mm-hmm. And something happened to me. I'll never be able to explain to you what happened to me. I'll never be able to explain to you what it was like for how long, because I'm not even sure what happened to me. Possible mm-hmm. Paul had an experience like that. Bill Wilson had an experience. Not everybody has those experiences. But something happened to me, and I was touched by something. As a result of that, I found myself in Alcoholics Anonymous. And when I was just a, a week or two sober, I found myself in the South Aid room of Alcoholics Anonymous. Being the guy in the room who, who was the newest guy, who knew the least about anything, who didn't understand anything about what they were talking about. And we've all been there. And there may be somebody here today who's like that, okay? I had no idea what these steps were. I had no idea what this group was all about. All I knew is that I couldn't have gotten to a place where I was any weaker, except that maybe when I was lying in the hospital gurney, and they held up this white chip, and I didn't know anybody in the room, and I stood up, and I walked from the back of the room to the front of the room, without hesitation, really, and I grabbed onto the chip, and I took it up and sat down in my seat. I was the newest guy in the place. And sometimes I feel that with all the work and all the effort and everything I'm trying to do in AA and everything that's helped me, sometimes I feel that I'll just never get back, that the, that the greatest point in my life, the closest I was to God, was the night I picked up my white chip. That it all started going downhill from there when I started getting the cars back, when I started getting the wife back, the cars back, the law office back, you know, you know, and all the other stuff back, you know, and, and although it's, it's a struggle and I tried somehow, the night I was all by myself and all alone and I had no money and I had nothing, I picked up my white chip and I was at my weakness. It was like, I was like on top of the mountain. And all I've been doing is trying to get back to that, that deal. And I don't know whether I can explain that, you know, other than just sort of tell you that's, that's just a, that's my deal. And, uh, and it, it, it's just sort of strange, you know. I told, I told somebody the other day, we were talking about my youngest child is going to get married, and I said, uh, I've married like three or four of them off or something, I'm not sure. 
I've lost count. I was telling somebody, I said, you know, I, and I know this is going to sound morbid, but I, I'll just say, I said, I much prefer funerals. Uh, I know the women are, yeah, but, but yeah, and you know, because somehow I like funerals, uh, especially the kind of funerals I go to, you know, where there's, with people of faith. They're usually not that sad of, a, of an event because somehow when I'm at a funeral, I have a feeling of the infinite and the eternal, and I get, I just get a, a more quieter and clearer picture of how fleeting and precious life is and how grateful I am just to have what I have, which is a relationship with God. Now, this may not be, you know, something that's applauded or thought of in everyday life in here, you know, you know, but that's just the way, you know, I think about these things. You know, and, and in any event, I, uh, I was thinking about where I am now at 33 years, almost 34 years sober, and where I was, you know, for the uh, first 20 years of my sobriety. I, I, I'm not going to talk a lot about drinking or any of that stuff because I'm more interested in uh, sobriety at this point. Uh, you're going to have to trust me when I when I tell you I had a drinking problem, uh, which isn't really the real problem here. That's just the symptom. The real problem is why I drank. I drank because I was an alcoholic. Al- alcoholism is something you suffer from when you're not drinking. Drunk is something that you get when you're <laughs> drinking. You know, when you're drinking, you're drunk. You know what I mean? When you're sober, you're an alcoholic, you know, you're suffering from alcoholism. That's to do with feelings and emotions. Alcoholism is, you know, when you say things like, I need a drink, what you're really trying to say is, the alcoholism is killing me. I need something to put it, uh, put it down. You know what I mean? I need something. And so you stop drinking, then you say, well, I need to have sex. Or you say, you stop, you stop that, you say, I need to buy a blouse. You stop that, you say, I need, I need, I need. When you need, when you need, that's uh, evidence and symptomatic of alcoholism, when you need anything, anything. And, uh, boy, this world is filled with a lot of things you can need and want and have to have, you know. And so you come, so, so I think about my, uh, and I was a needy person. So I think about coming into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I don't want to give the impression that um, my uh, sobriety was bad. Because it was blessed, it was wonderful, it was great. This light was like it was like ABC's Wild World of Sports, you know, the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat. You ever see that thing? I know we got some old things here where the guy's going down that ski jump or whatever it is, that ski slump, and he looks so beautiful. He's going 100 miles per hour, and he says the thrill of victory, and then all of a sudden he lifts off and he starts spinning like a propeller lateral and he hits a pine tree, you know, and the agony of the, that's like my sobriety, you know. It would be great, and then every once in a while there's an explosion, you know what I mean? But when I say there's an explosion every once in a while, that's like every day. Every day, you know, you know, the truth is, the way I remember my first 10, 15, maybe even 20 years, 15, 20 years of sobriety, is it was painful. I'm a sensitive guy. I don't care what my sponsor says. He, my sponsor, I used to say I was sensitive to my sponsor. He'd say, no, great artists are sensitive. You're just touchy. I've never heard, I've never seen anybody who felt injustice as like, uh, like I feel injustice. You know what I mean? I hear about children being crucified over there or something like that. I carry that for like weeks and months, you know. I hear about people's heads being chopped off. It just kills me. I feel about, hear about stuff coming, you know, I, I mean, you know, the, the best thing for me to do would be to, to stop listening to all TV, all radio, and just hide in a box because things just affect me that bad. I haven't seen anybody on the planet that is as sensitive or is as affected as much by injustice as I am, you know. I mean, it just, it's just, it's just painful to me. To watch what goes on. The, forget about what's happening to me. Forget about what's happening around me. It's 3,000 miles away. I can't handle it. You know, I mean, life is just, it's just overwhelming bad. There's too many moving parts. You know what I mean? And, and, uh, and I've got to tell you, my first 10 years of sobriety, first 15 years, and I was doing this stuff. I was doing the steps. I was sponsoring people. I was doing it by the numbers. I was doing the deal. It wasn't like I was slacking off, although we all sort of, you know, rest on our laurels and we slack off from time to time. But I was really doing it, I think, as good as you could do it. And notwithstanding that, for many, many years, it was pockmarked by daily, weekly crises. Things where I'd have to call up my sponsor or go to a meeting or work the steps or do the 10th step or pray or say the serenity prayer 10 times. I mean, there was just crap happening, you know. It was painful. Sobriety for me was wonderful and incredibly painful. And if you're in your first five years or ten years, you know it's all about the money. 
I mean, yeah, I know money's not important. It's it's just right up there with oxygen, you know. I mean, it's it's you know somewhere around there, you know, and uh, it's not important to, until you don't have it. You know what I'm talking about? And if it wasn't the money, it was the wife. And it wasn't the wife, it was the kids. If it wasn't the kids, it was the boss. If it wasn't the boss, it was the job. If it wasn't that, it was something else. There's always I don't know about you, but sometimes you just try to do the best job you can, and there's just somebody, there's, it's like, what do they say on Saturday Night, Night Live, that gal just, it's always something, you know what I mean? You're doing everything right, and then all of a sudden you go home, and you're being audited by the IRS. I mean, what's that all about, okay? I mean, you got a telephone call, and your whole life is destroyed. I mean, something is always waiting for you to happen. You're just driving down the street, and all of a sudden somebody hits your car. you got a flat. Whatever. Life for me is just, it's just a painful event, okay? And you know, you know, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's, as you're going along and you're working this thing, sometimes you get less and less. I mean, sometimes the crises get farther apart instead of every five minutes, you know, or every other hour, you know, it's just like once a day, you know what I mean? And, and you know, maybe you're able to sort of let go and let God, you know, and, and what do they call it? Turn it over. You learn how to turn it over. So, you know, what used to take you three weeks and a banana to turn over, now you can do it in like three days. Then you get to be able to do it in three hours. But it seems there's always something you got to turn over, you know, something in your life which is unacceptable. And let me tell you something. I'm experiencing that sort of rough type of deal in life. Maybe you're experiencing something like that. Maybe you're experiencing that kind of sobriety. And let me tell you something. If you're experiencing that type of sobriety, I've got to get some good news for you. Don't panic. It's perfectly normal. It's perfectly normal. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you something else. It's better than normal. It's a good thing. You know, this book is based upon the, the one of the books this is based on, our book, is, a, is the book of James. And the first part of the book of James in the Bible says, rejoice when you have troubles. Rejoice when you're beaten down to a pulp, you have troubles. Because endurance through troubles while you're weak helps you focus on God and builds your strength. There it is again. Weakness brings you closer to Him and will make you a better and a person of better character and stronger faith to be able to, to, be able to straight, face what's going on in the world. So somehow, some way, while working this program and being constantly, because every time I was so fortunate to have the sponsors that I had and to hear the message I heard, because no matter what was going on, as I was beaten, being beaten down in life, and life it will, is a humbling experience. It will beat you down. It will happen. Nobody's going to escape the cancer. Nobody's going to escape that. Nobody's going to escape death. Dick Williams and those people you love, they're going to die. You, you know, people you love are going to die. You're going to get older. Stuff's going to, you're never going to ex escape it. And I would come in here and I would speak to a sponsor. I would hear a message. And somehow, the, uh, even though I had no money and they were going to foreclose on me and my kids were going to be out on the street and it was all going to be horrible and I'd come in here and nobody was offering me money. <laughs> nobody was saying, here's, uh, here's 10000 you know what I mean? Nobody was offering money. <laughs> nobody was offering me a job. They would say, you know, seek God and clean house. Everything they said to me was always, I was talking about money. <laughs> I'm talking about money here, you know, cash. And they're talking about God. And I'm trying to figure out, I'm, I'm thinking, there's no understanding here. I'm talking about money. I got, I mean, the God is great, and I like AA, and I'm not putting anything down, but, you know, you know, I mean, I got serious problems, you know? I mean, you don't understand. You know, I can't pay the mortgage, you know what I mean? I mean, how's God going to help with that? And my sponsor says, I think it's time for you to start making coffee. I don't think you're listening to me. I don't think you're hearing what I'm saying. Why don't you try to find somebody else? I mean, every time I would talk about material stuff, my car, he would talk about something that would point me towards him. See to it your relationship with him is right, and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. No person's going to help you. You're not going to manage your way out of this. You're not going to think your way out of this. You know, God could and would if he was sought. There is one that has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. When we make this decision sincerely, all sorts of remarkable things happen. Being all powerful, he gives us everything we need if we stay close to him and perform his work well. He stay close to him and perform his work well. We begin to be, be unconcerned with our little plants designs. We start becoming concerned with other people. We lose fear of yesterday, today, and tomorrow where we're born. 
all about God. But you know, when you have a guy like me where my whole life, all I'm doing is thinking about money, sex, women, girlfriends, romance, things, cars, when your entire life is focused, you know, don't let any alcoholic say he doesn't worship God. Every alcoholic I know worships God. Sometimes God is in the form of a gal. My sponsor used to say, you know, underneath every skirt is a slip. Sometimes guys, what they do is all they do is think about gals. They talk about gals. I used to I hang, I hang around with a guy. I used to be one of those guys. And every time a guy would walk in, he'd say, look at that one. I, I remember going to lunch with some guy. He'd go down the elevator and he said, look at that one. I would just look at that one. And then he hit me and says, look at that one over there. <laughs> look at that one, you know? And I, I mean, I couldn't walk five blocks with this guy would be hitting me with his elbow. Look at that one. Look at that one. Look at that one. And, and, and it was sort of funny until I remembered that used to be me. Don't tell me alcoholics don't worship things. I used to worship women. If worship has to do with constantly thinking about something, that's what I would think about. Women and romance. And cars and money. All sort of wrapped up in together, one little stew. You know what I mean? You know? And that's, that's, now, now listen, you may develop a drinking problem worrying about all that stuff. And how you're going to get all that stuff. Or feeling sorry for yourself that you don't have all that stuff. We're envying people that have that stuff. You may you may drink because of that, get a drinking problem, wind up here and saying you're an alcoholic. But let me tell you something, when you stop the drinking, the thinking, the manner of thinking, the way of life, being an alcoholic is as much of an obsession with a certain way of life and a mindset and an attitude, and even more so than about the drinking. It's even more involved in that. And you'll find, if you look back on it, that every time you're upset and every time you're scared and every time you're full of fear and every time you're running to a me and every time you're doing something, it's because of some person, place, or thing. Some material thing is unacceptable to you because you're scared you're going to lose something that you already got or you're not going to get something that you think you need when actually you don't need anything. But, of course, you don't know that, and I didn't know that. So what happens is I come in here, I stop the drinking, but the alcohol is what we call alcoholism which, by the way, they're infected by the same by the same bug that we're infected. They're infected out there. All you got to do is go out there and see what they're talking about, see what's in the movies, see what's on the bill. They got the same deal going on, you know. They're committing suicide out there. They're 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 living lives of quiet desperation. They may not be drinking themselves to death. They may be smoking themselves to death. You know, they may be sexing themselves to death. They may be doing a lot of themselves to death. You know, but they're living lives of quiet desperation. It's just you can't be arrested for driving while feeling sorry for yourself. <laughs> you just live a miserable life. And one day you die and you've never even lived. They're not being rocketed in the fourth dimension of existence. Experience, you, know, you, know, you know, that's what the book says. It says you're going to experience much of heaven and be rocketed in the fourth dimension of existence. That's not happening out there. You know, it's really happening in here. Because of our weakness. Because of our weakness. They've never gotten weak enough to get to the point where they had to reboot, where they had to die to self. You know, being miserable, you'd be surprised how many years you can be miserable. Hey, listen, you could be miserable in here for 60 years, hanging around here. You can be miserable in here and never really get the deal. You're just sort of hanging around day A, not drinking and everything like that, and thinking that's the deal. That's what we saw, about. So I look at this thing, and I... Uh, and I, and, I, and I realized, you know, looking back or sort of looking about what's, I realized at some point in time in my life, uh, I don't know when it was, maybe within the last few years, I realized that something's happened in my life. Something's really, I remember when I was nine years sober, when I was nine years sober working this thing, and I had some sort of problem. Now, I'm nine years sober, I'm sponsoring people, I'm doing step meetings, I'm doing the whole bit. And I had some problem that was eating my liver, just driving me nuts, you know. I couldn't talk about it. I couldn't stop thinking about it. It was scaring me. And I really got upset, and I said, when is, when is this going to stop? I've been doing this blessed thing for nine years, as hard as you can. And here I am back, here I am back in the crapper again, worried about with this anxiety and this fear and everything like that. When is this going to stop, you know? And that's when I opened up the book, and all of a sudden, for the first time in my weakness, I noticed that part that says, we are not cured. All we have is a daily reprieve, depending upon our spiritual condition, depending upon our relationship with God. And then I started reading the part of the big book where it talks about even the guy, uh, Bill Dotson, who says, I knew there was something more, something that I hadn't got. And I would see people, 
In AA, usually they had 30, 40 years. They might be dying of cancer. They might have horrible things going on. And they were, they were, they were at peace. And how, did, how do you do that? How do you do that? And, and somewhere along the line in the last few years, what I've recognized is my life has gotten, because I, because you know, I'm an alcoholic. I'm impatient. I don't know how many of you guys are impatient. You know, listen, the way I used to solve problems is I'd take a drink. I'd say, give me a double. You give me a double, I'd go whack. And all of a sudden, everything was okay. <laughs> and I go whack again because if one is good, two is better, or four is better. And I, I just, you know, listen, I could feel better in a nanosecond. You know what I mean? I'm not into 50 meetings and do a four step. You know what I mean? And you'll feel better. I like, I like the, you know, give me a pill, let me smoke something, let me pop something, give me, let me drink something. You know what I mean? I need a drink. I could feel better like that. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not into you'll feel better in 10 or 15 years kind of crap. You know what I mean? And, uh, and uh, so the bottom line is, but uh, somewhere along the, ra- along the way, you know, there's a long road reconstruction ahead. Somewhere along the, ra- along the way, <clears throat> for me, it was maybe around 22, 23, 25, 27, whatever it is, years, I started realizing uh, that life was great. It wasn't like... Uh, it wasn't like the first 10 years. It wasn't even like the, the first 20 years. It was like incredible. It was, I, I can't even explain it. I can't, I, it's not like I didn't have problems. It's just like things would happen. People would do things. People would act badly. Stuff would happen. Checks would bounce. Explosions would happen. You know, accidents would happen. Flats would happen. People would, dis- would disappoint. People would be, I mean, life would happen. And it was like I was like, uh, it was like I was unconscious. I, I just didn't, uh, I don't know how to explain it, except to say uh, it didn't affect me. I was unaffected. I was unaffected. I, I, it's hard to explain how you can be unaffected when things are happening around you and to you. But things didn't, uh, piss, I wasn't reacting. I'd respond, I'd say something, and... Uh, and when you're unaffected and you don't react even to the bad stuff, what seemingly is bad happening around you, uh, you'd be surprised how great life can become. You'd be surprised. When you're not running from crisis to crisis, when you're not running to discussion meetings to explain to people the crap that you wouldn't believe what happened to me today, when you're not, when you're not going over in your mind, when you, when you don't have a mind full of people, you know, that you're pissed off at or that you're trying to kill or execute, you know what I mean? You know, and yeah, you're laughing, you don't know what it's like, but you know, when you're not, when you're not constantly hating people or feeling sorry for yourself, you'd be surprised how great you can even, bad stuff can be and happen, crazy stuff can happen, you even find it funny, it's like a giant situation comedy, you know what I mean? And I started realizing that this had happened to me. And it wasn't like something that, you know, when you, when you first start noticing that you're feeling good, maybe you'll notice it for like an hour or two hours or a day, and then it'll go away. You know, then it'll come back, and then it goes away. And you expect it to go, and I started realizing that this thing wasn't going away. It was like, I'll use the word permanent. It was like this life had become this deal. You know what I mean? And... uh not, not, not drudgery or anything like that. It was just, it was just a joyous sort of deal. And, and then I would read things in the big book, in the 12 and 12, where they would say, this is the deal. This is what happens. This is the incredible thing. This is the great fact. This is what happens. And this is possible in Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay? It's possible for that. I'm not saying you've got to wait for 25 years, although in my heart I believe that's true, you know? <laughs> to keep out the imposters, you know what I mean? I believe it's true, but, but what, what I find as I read the steps, then all of a sudden as I see the end product and I see what's going on, and I'm not to the end, and, you know, I, I hang out with guys who've got like 57 years, you know what I mean? So I always have people in front of me. When I see it, then all of a sudden I see the steps in a different light. I see how they actually work like a, like a machine almost to formulate. I see how step seven, almost how life, how trials, how tribulations, how even the worst thing you think is going to happen in your life sort of works to weaken you, crush you, make you small, you, smaller, and either push you to the bottle, push you to suicide, or push you to God. I see how that happens. I see how life, how the vice gets tighter 
and tighter and tighter and tighter. And some can't give up the woman. And some can't give up the money. They just can't let go and let God. And they, you know, it's so hard when you're focused on the world, when you love the world. It's so hard when you love everything in the world, when the world is so important to you. It's so hard when worldly things are more important to you than anything else. You will kill people, you will hurt people, you will hurt yourself just to hang on to that car, to hang on to that title, to hang on to that job, to hang on to that person. It's so tough when things become more important than anything else, more when become your God. It's so hard and some people cannot let go. Forget about letting go of alcohol, they just can't let go of that stuff. And the world will crush you and crush you and crush you and crush you and some of them peel off and they die and they drink. Some of them they peel off and they drug. Some of them just die, you know, of, of suicide and they kill themselves. And some people somehow, some way, just turn away. They let go. Because you know what it says? It says, it says something about you either have to let go completely or the results are nil. I heard that somewhere. Did they say that? It says, you got or the results are nil. Absolutely, or the results are nil. What could they be talking about? I don't think it's alcohol. I think some other stuff based upon my experience. And some people do what the Apostle Paul did, where God said, I'm not going to relieve you of this. You know what I'm talking about? He says, I'm not going to relieve you of this. He says, you're going to have to turn like you did when you picked up the white chip, like you did when you're on that hospital gurney. You're going to have to turn to me. You're going to have to be closer to me. And what I noticed is the more, the more I got closer to him, and I could tell when I was getting closer to him. You know, people say, how can you tell you? I mean, how do you get closer to God? You know, you may not realize that you're closer, but what I, what I could tell is I was always, I was thinking more about him. I was thinking more about God. I was thinking more about God. I was reading the Bible. I was getting involved in Bible studies. You know, I was, I was hanging around with preachers. I was joining churches. You know, all that stuff is encouraged in AA. Church membership is encouraged in AA. You know, you know, prayer and meditation is encouraged in AA. All that stuff. I was, I was going to more meetings, not less meetings. I was hanging around more with people that were talking about the stuff I was talking about, about the God stuff. You know what I mean? And what you find is, listen, if you're a car enthusiast, when cars are your thing, you hang around car people. When you're a sex enthusiast, you hang around like the Playboy Club or whoever they, whatever they're doing sex around. Yeah, I don't know what they, the bars or something like that. When you're a tennis enthusiast, you hang around all the tennis. When you're a golf enthusiast, you play golf all the time. When you're a God enthusiast, <laughs> when God is your the answer to your deal, you know what it is? You just like hanging around people that are talking about God. You just read books that are about God. You just want to think about God and talk about God. I mean, that's just it. And the more you talk about God, the more enthusiastic you get. And what I found, what I found in my own life, and I'm just sharing this, is that is that the more I thought about God, the less I thought about my car. <laughs> the more I thought about God, the less I thought about, you know, in a sense, things. It's not that all of a sudden I was somewhere living in some cloud somewhere or something like that. I mean, I have a nice car. You know, I'm not saying you can't have a nice car. It was just that if the car got scratched, it didn't bother me that much. You know, if somehow I had to give up the car, it wouldn't be the end of my life. You know, you understand? in other words, what, what I found was that the stuff was not, I was not owning, the stuff was not owning me. You know, I used to think I owned the stuff. The stuff owned me. The people owned me. The job owned me. Somehow I had this idea in my mind that no matter what happened as far as the job, no matter what happened with the money, no matter what happened with anything, you know, I would be okay as long as I put my trust in God. And then, you know something, as soon as I started thinking that, all of a sudden I read this thing in the big book where it says job or no job, wife or no wife, you can recover you know, job or no job, no matter what, as long as you trust God and clean house. I saw something in the big book, let no man say that he needs his family back. Not even his family. Not even his family. Like the most important thing. He says, your sobriety, they mean not only physical, but mental sobriety is based upon your relationship with God. So apparently these guys, these guys were saying the same thing. And here's the interesting thing about it. And this was my experience. This is what was happening to me. And I started putting something together. That this whole program was about getting me closer to God and growing my faith and, and, and getting my faith stronger and stronger so he would be the centerpiece of my life 
And then all of a sudden I realized something. In the big book they say something that the great fact is that God had become the centerpiece of our life. That he, we somehow realized that he was living in us, miraculously, in our hearts. You know what I said? And all of a sudden it sort of start, it started making sense to me. You know, that this was a total God, everything was a God thing. To get me to the point where I focused everything on God. And then I went to AA meetings and I talked about it and they didn't like me. <laughs> they got mad. They got mad. I was trying to tell them, hey, that's what this thing means. There is one who has all power to make that is gun may you find him now. This is the great fact, this is a tremendous fact. See the relation with him is right. The great events will come to pass for you and countless others. It's all about God. And they said, Why do you have to talk so much about God? I said, But that's the deal. That's it, man. That's the thing. You know, it's out of the Bible, it's been around for two thousand years. That's the cure for our problem. And they didn't like me. <laughs> they said, I don't like that Russell guy, you know what I mean? And then I read that chapter of the Agnostics and they said, That's why we wrote this book. And that means we're going to talk about God. And that's when the trouble started. That's when they explained it to me. You're going to have problems if you talk about what's in this book. Because alcoholics don't want to do this thing. You're going to be talking to, this is not exactly well people's anonymous. You're going to be talking to groups of people who are dying. And they don't even know why they're dying. And you're going to be presenting what, you're going to be presenting the answer. And a whole bunch of them are going to hate you for it. You understand what I'm saying? And, and, of course, if you're an alcoholic, you have to understand something. One of the problems, one of the consequences of being an alcoholic is you, you not only worry about money, you not only worry about cars, you not only worry about prestige, you worry a lot about what other people think about you. That's the whole point about fear of people and economic security. You worry about how you look to people and whether they're talking behind your back and stuff like that. You know, the old saying, you want to kill somebody in AA, just walk up and say, you wouldn't believe what they're saying about you. You know, I mean, oh man, you know, put a knife to their chest, you know, but, uh, and so, and so here you are, you're experiencing this thing, but you're sort of scared to talk about it because you think they'll turn some people off and they won't like you and everything like that. And, you know, it's just another trial. You just have to get past it and, and, and go forward. And it's just one more thing that you're going to have to take that pressure. You know, it's right in the Sermon on the Mount. That was one of the main books I read. He says, he says, he says, rejoice when people say all sorts of bad things about you. You know, when you talk about me, you know what I mean? Because that's the way it's been all along. He says, that's the way it is. When you start talking about the truth, you see what happens is the people are going to come back, come out back and they're going to, they're going to hate you for it. Some people, but not all people. You understand what I'm saying? But the point is, I got no choice. I'm like compelled. Like Bill Wilson said, the Lord's been so wonderful to me, curing me of this terrible disease that I got to keep talking about it and telling other people. And so that's all I do. I just tell about what's going on in my life. So, <clears throat> so my first wife <coughs> says to me, so that being the prologue for this deal, now I'm going to read a couple things in the big book, which may make May, I, I'm hoping that when I read these things, you'll look at it a little bit differently. You understand? With all that stuff I just said. Let's start with the uh, 12 and 12 on the seven steps. And supposedly, I don't know if it's on the seven step or not, but for us, the gaining of a new perspective. Oh, well, you like this one. This first part is, this is in step seven. No alcohol can surely, no member of A wants to deprecate material achievement. Nor do we enter into debate that many so passionately cling to the belief that to satisfy our basic natural desires is the main object of life. Gather up the things, gather up the sex, gather up the romance. But we are sure that no class of people in the world has ever made a worse mess of trying to live by this formula than alcoholics. For thousands of years, we have been demanding more than our share of security, prestige, and romance. And it goes on to say that, you know, we have to focus on, what do you think it says? God. God. That's the thing. That's what changes the character. That's where the psychic change comes from. It says, by the way, let me tell you how the process is. It says, for us, the process of gaining that new perspective was ready for this. Unbelievably painful. <laughs> Unbelievably painful. That's the process. You know, you guys, guess what? You're involved in the process. If you're in here, you're involved in the process. The first 20 years ain't going to be so good. It ain't going to be so good. It's going to be, it's not going to be, it's not going to be that bad, but it's going to be, you know, this thing where he says, what is it? My, my worst day sober is, is better than my best day drunk. That's not necessarily true. <laughs> Believe me, trust me. That is not, I mean, that's something you tell a new person. I don't know what you tell them. It's, we say all sorts of shit to people. You know what I mean? But the bottom line is you can have some really bad three. Listen, when you have no money 
and you got four kids, you know what I mean? And you don't know where the money's coming from, and they're foreclosing on your house, and it's 3 o'clock in the morning, and there's just you, trust me, it can get real dark and real bad, and some people commit suicide, and you can be sober as a judge, you know what I mean? And not wanting to drink, but I'll tell you, killing yourself looks awfully damn good. You know what I'm talking? You could be, you could have really bad moments in sobriety. It says, for us, the process of gaining a new perspective was unbelievably painful. And I think unbelievably painful, I don't think that's just like a, a little pinprint. I mean, they choose their words. It was only by repeated humiliations, more than once, that we were forced to learn something about humility. It was only at the end of a long road, marked by successive defeats and humiliations and the final crushing of our self-sufficiency that we began to feel humility is something more than a condition of groveling despair. Every newcomer in Alcoholics Anonymous, like when I picked up my white chip, is told and soon realizes for himself that his humble admission of powerlessness, of weakness over alcohol is his first step towards liberation from his paralyzing grip. Now you're going to learn about your powerlessness over the world. Now you're going to learn about your powerlessness over money. Now you're going to learn about your powerlessness over your health, over things, over life itself. Now you're going to learn the hard way over your powerlessness over what's going to happen to you. or what you. Th yeah, man plans and God laughs. You're going to learn about that stuff. It says here, this improved perception of humility starts another revolutionary change in our outlook. Our eyes begin to open to immense values which come straight out of painful ego puncturing. Ego puncturing. Until now, our life, you know, we, we begin to see the value of suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, upon, until now, our lives have been largely devoted to running from pain and problems. We fled from them as a pain. We never wanted to deal with the fact of suffering. Escape out of the bottle was always our solution. Character building through suffering might be all right for saints, but it didn't appear, but it didn't appeal to us. Then in A, we looked and we listened, and we found that that the people that actually made it, the people we looked up to, those were the guys that were dying of cancer or had been through tough times, and they had somehow gotten through it with some sort of grace and some sort of dignity, so that you were looking at these guys when they spoke, and you said, how does he do that? How, how do you do that? How do you lose a son or a daughter or a grandson to a drunken driver when you're six years sober, and somehow all of a sudden your chair means you're trying to help others? How do you do that? I couldn't do that. And we realize that the people that we look up to are people that have really gone through some incredibly tough things. Not the people that are making all the money and all sorts of stuff. We look up to them when we're envious and everything like that. But the people we really put, you know, put up and look at them and say, man, how do you do that? My wife, my first wife, you know, I tell this story and as I'm making, you know, they said to me, one of the consequences of being an alcoholic is you just don't see stuff. I got like sunscreen. Suns I have like sun I've got spiritual sunscreen on. There's stuff going on around me. I just don't get it. She said to me, You come home drunk one more time, I'm leaving you. I was sober as a judge. I was sober as I am right now. She looked at me. My wife had my house, everything to lose. She said, I just want you to know, you come home drunk one more time, I'm losing you. Twelve words, very clear. I got she wasn't kidding. I got in my car, I drove three blocks, I stopped at a light, I say to myself, what the hell did she mean by that? <laughs> what the hell did she mean by that? <laughs> Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. You can read this book for twenty years. Twenty years, the entire book. And not under and be saying to yourself, what the hell did they mean by that? You'd be shocked. Let me read you something. Perhaps there is a better way. Perhaps there is a better way. We think so. For we are now on a different basis. The basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. We are in the world to play the role he assigns just to the extent that we do as we think he would have us, he would have us, and humbly rely on him, does he enable us to match calamity with serenity? What the hell do they mean by that? What the hell do they mean by that? What does that mean? What that, what's that all about? We're not supposed to rely on ourselves? Gotta, what the hell could they mean? What? I mean, really, you're not supposed to have self-reliance? You're not supposed to rely on yourself? What am I, like, I'm, I'm like a nothing? I mean, what the hell? <clears throat> Let me read that again. <laughs> Perhaps there is a better way. We think so. 
For you are now on a base, a different basis. We are now on the basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. We are in the world to play the role he assigns, just to the extent that we do as we think he would have us, and humbly rely on him, does he enable us to match calamity with serenity. I mean, what the hell do they mean by that? I mean, the words are as clear as when my wife said, you come home drunk one more time, I'm leaving you. And alcoholics have read this for years and years and years, and they just don't get it. And then they go out and they talk about the car, and they go to school and they talk about the, the sex, and they talk about the wife, and they talk about the husband, and they talk about the job, and they talk about everything. And they've read that a thousand times, you know, and they don't, they don't understand why they have problems. They don't understand why they're thumb-sucking crybabies. They don't understand because they read it, and they, they read it, and they don't see it. Every paragraph in this book says the same exact thing a different way, and alcoholics read the whole thing, and they don't even see it. They don't even see what the book is saying. Whether it's, you know, see what your relation with him is great, and great events will come to pass, and you will tell us others. Where there is, whether they say, there is one that has all power, that one is God, may you find them now. Where they say, you can't manage your way out of it, no human power is going to help you, only God couldn't would if you saw it. If they say it a thousand different ways, we wrote a book where we're going to talk about God. If a mere code of morals and better philosophy of life would have helped us, we'd have been sober a long time ago, but that would help us. No code no of morals, no thinking, you know, because we lack the power. We lack the power to, to follow those deals. We had to find a power, and that's why we wrote this book, which means we're going to talk about God, and here's what we don't, here's what we say, what the hell do they mean by that? You know what I mean? What the hell, what do they, what do they mean by that? You know? <laughs> We never apologize to anyone for depending upon our creator. We never apologize to anyone for depending upon our creator. What the hell do they mean by that? We can laugh at those who think spirituality is a way of weakness. Paradoxically, it's a way of strength. The verdict of the age is that faith means courage. All men of faith have courage. They trust their God. We never apologize for God. Instead, we let him demonstrate through us what he can do. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be at once, he commenced to outgrow fear. Mm. What the hell do they mean by that? <laughs> what the hell do they mean by that? And so I go to an A meeting and I try every way I can, no matter what step I'm on, to impress people about how important it is to forget about everything else and just focus upon God. And then half the room walks out. Half the room walks out. Because they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it from me. They don't want to hear it from you. You know, they want to know how to do step four. <laughs> they want to know how to do step five. You know what I mean? They want to get through the exercises so they can graduate and then get well and get the car and get the gal and get the deal. You know what I mean? And all I know is I, I look at this thing, and not that the steps aren't important, not that the meetings aren't important, not that all these tools are not important, but none of it means anything if at the end it doesn't point you towards God, which is probably why the 11th step is there, where you finally wind up on the 11th step, and it says, now that you've got this relationship, try to improve it. And then what do they say? Now that you got that deal going on, try to tell other people about it. I mean, this is not a complicated, this is not a complicated thing unless you happen to be an alcoholic. <laughs> then it's a real problem. You understand what I'm saying? Because your disease tells you it's bullshit. You understand what I'm saying? Your disease tells you not to do it. It, it is so, you know, it, it is so, it's, it's so counterintuitive to an alcoholic who is absolutely convinced that his entire life should depend upon whether he's happy and how he feels. And his feelings are more important and to feel good You've got to have things and acquire things, and you need things. It's so hard, which is probably why it takes 25 years to get pound, have it pounded out of you. It's probably why. It's not because I'm stupid, you know. As a matter of fact, it's probably because I, it probably took 25 years because I'm smart, because I tried to figure every way of doing it without doing it. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? But why? I'll tell you. But life is just too powerful for me, you know. It finally got me. So thank you very much.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.